So in response to a recent story that we've run at the Herald about uh, concerns over some forthcoming PISA data about Scottish education, the Scottish Government um, responded by making a number of claims about other data from other aspects of the education system. And I think this is maybe quite a good example to look at in terms of showing you not just how the government uses stats, but how the government spins education stats in order to find the, the positive angle that they'll be looking for. So let's have a look at the claims that were made and I'll try and give you a sense of maybe a little bit more of the context around them. The first claim was that the overall pass rates for National 5 higher and Advanced higher are up from the pre-pandemic level and that's absolutely correct. All three pass rates are higher in 2023 than they were in 2019. However, if we were to, for example, slightly broaden our definition of what pre-pandemic means, the picture would start to change. For National 5, yes, the 2023 pass rate is higher than the 2019 figure, but it's lower than the figure in 2016 and 2017. For higher, the 2023 pass rate is higher than it was in 2019, but that 2019 figure was actually one in which there had been quite a noticeable dip in the pass rate that year. So this maybe isn't the achievement it necessarily seems. The situation in higher is that the pass rate now is the same as it was in 2018, and it's lower than it was from 2014 to 2017. And we see basically the same pattern at advanced higher level as well. The pass rate right you now, 2013, 2023, sorry, right now is higher than 2019, but it's lower than it was between 2014 and 2018. The next claim is that we were also seeing increases in the pass rates for higher maths, biology, chemistry, and physics. Now for the sciences, that is 100% true. The pass rates for biology, chemistry and physics at higher are higher than they were pre-pandemic and we're not just talking about 2019 in that case. Maybe a little caveat there, one that science teachers are currently raising is that up until this year, the COVID adjustments were still in place and in the sciences that meant the coursework assignment had been taken away. It's been reintroduced this year and there are concerns that might have an impact on things like the pass rate. So that'll be worth keeping an eye on. There's also a reason it only says um, increases in the pass rates at higher for those subjects because, for example, for National 5 Physics, the pass rate has gone down. But what if we look at maths that was part of that claim? Well, it's like the previous examples. Yes, it's accurate if all we do is look at the 2019 figures. But the pass rate now is lower than it was in 2016, 17 and 18. And there's another caveat needed for maths, which is that in 2021, a course called Applications of Maths was introduced. What it basically means, without wanting to go into every detail about that course, is that some students who would previously have struggled with the higher mathematics course are probably now doing higher applications of maths and the entry numbers went up between 2021 and 2022 as well so there are more and more young people doing that course if that course is doing the job it was intended to do which is give this alternative and more accessible route for some sort of maths qualification then you would probably expect that to have an impact on the overall pass rates for your higher maths course. The next claim that was made was that we've had the biggest ever reduction in the attainment gap in literacy and numeracy in primary schools in a single year. And yeah, no problem at all. Absolutely true. In fact, you know, this is true if we look at the combined figure for primary school for P1, P4 and P7. Reading, writing, listening and talking, combined literacy and combined numeracy, you have seen the biggest reduction in a single year in those stats. But there are massive caveats required to this. It is only true that there has been the biggest drop on record because in the year before we had seen an enormous increase. So it isn't exactly the same thing as suddenly seeing a huge drop that's come out of nowhere or come off a consistent pattern. That's not what happened here. And the other issue here is when you turn around and say this is the biggest drop we've ever seen in a single year, well is that not just kind of an admission that you've never managed significant reductions before? So if we look, for example, at that you know combined primary school data, the biggest drop there had been previously was just 1.1 percentage point. So saying that this is the biggest drop we've ever had as some sort of enormous achievement, well, you know, we're not exactly clearing a particularly high bar here. The final claim was that record proportions of school weavers are going on to positive destinations, and that includes work 
training and further study, higher education, further education, unis and colleges. And yeah, that that definitely, again, absolutely true. And back in 2010, um, fewer than 90% of school leavers were going on to a positive destination. Today, that's 95.7%. That's a significant increase. That's the highest figure on record. But for positive destinations, the issue is that there is a fundamental issue with the data itself and that it's too broad. It doesn't give us the sort of detail we would need to be using it for the purposes people like to use it for. So, for example, yes, we know that um, 25%, 25.1% of school leavers went to employment in the most recent stats, but we don't know what kind of employment. We don't know the quality of that employment. We don't know how much they were getting paid. We don't know if it involves future progression. We do know that that figure includes people who are on zero hours contracts. The same zero hours contracts that politicians so often describe as exploitative. The problem with positive destinations is that it's just really clumsy data. And there's an example I can give you that can show you this where you'd look at it and think, you know, is this really a positive destination for somebody? Let's say you're a highly able young person. Let's say all the way through school, you're always getting top grades. You're always working incredibly hard. You've always wanted to go and do medicine. And as you go into your fourth and fifth year of high school, there's no reason to think that's not going to happen. Every single teacher says that that's what you can achieve. Every um, opportunity has been provided to make sure that that can happen for you. That is going to happen for you. And then something goes wrong. You get ill. Someone in your family dies. You have to move house unexpectedly. Your education is disrupted. And for whatever reason, you get unlucky. The system lets you down, doesn't adapt quickly enough. You end up failing those exams. Because of all that, because of the impact of all that, you end up leaving school with few, if any, qualifications. The dream of going and doing medicine is, is you know, all but gone. So you leave school and you've got little option but to accept a zero hours contract job for minimum wage. Well, after all that, the government will count you as having achieved a positive destination. So these are just a few examples of the way in which education stats can be spun in order to provide the positive angle, the positive headline that somebody might be desperately trying to achieve. And hopefully this now lets you maybe understand a little bit more about what it is you're, you know, you're reading when you pick up these news stories and you'll maybe know what to look out for next time.